Apparently you guys were waiting for this. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> so there's no need for an intro to this one. Let's get right to it. The long awaited remote ID final ruling was just released and I read all 470 mind numbing pages of it so you don't have to. Now this video is gonna be kinda long, so there will be timestamps in the video description below if you wanna go ahead and skip ahead to certain topics. Now I'm gonna give you the highlights, the lowlights, and scattered throughout, I'll be sure to interject my thoughts. Also, I'm gonna briefly talk about the other ruling that was released at the same time as Remote ID, and that's regarding flights over people and flying at night for part 107 pilots. Now, because this thing is so long and I read it in less than three days, it is quite possible that I make a mistake in the information that I'm gonna to present to you here in this video. Now, if I do make a mistake or if you notice something that just doesn't sound right, I'm sure that the comments will point it out. And then what I'll do is I'll put any corrections that are necessary in the video description. So if you're watching this and you hear something that you think is wrong, check the video description first before you comment. I appreciate it. Now, if you don't know what remote ID is, I'll put the definition up here right on the screen. So go ahead and pause this video and read through that if this is the first time that you've ever heard the term remote ID. Now, the first thing that I wanna do is give you the good news because there actually is some good news. First of all, if you had any doubt at all that they read the 53,000 comments that were submitted, it is clear that they did not ignore them at all. They read every single one of them. The main reason that this document is so long that it's 470 pages is because for every rule that was implemented, they referenced a number of comments that were submitted in relation to that rule. And many of them referred to one commenter, like one commenter stated this or one commenter expressed concerns and so on. So it wasn't just comments from large groups or corporations or organizations that were considered. So if you submitted a comment, just know that you did have a voice and an effective one in some instances. Now, the biggest being that they omitted the original proposal of requiring drones to send identifying information over the internet. Now, that happened, I believe, because of the comments. Now, at least I like to think so. Others will tell you that it was removed because some large corporations complained that sending data over the internet was a security concern. So, we'll see if this changes in the future, which... It actually might, and what makes me think that? Guess how many times this document states that network-based remote ID is not being implemented at this time. 31 times it says that. That's about every 15 pages they state at this time. So it's not very comforting to hear that, but anyway, for now, instead of being required to be connected to the internet to fly, UAVs will just be required to broadcast locally through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And that's huge, especially for people that live and fly in remote areas or for rescue operations that occur in places without internet connectivity. Now, the second item of good news is that the FAA is giving manufacturers 18 months to comply with those standards. And then they're giving pilots 30 months to be flying those compliant drones. So we have over two and a half years before this will be fully implemented. You have a lot of time to enjoy the hobby in the same way that you always have. Now, for those of you worried about whether your Mavic Pro or your Mavic Pro Platinum or your Mavic Air will be subject to this, I know you don't wanna hear this, but more than likely your Mavic Pro will not be functional by the time Remote ID is fully operational. And I say that because through research, the average lifespan of a drone is found to be about three years. Now I know many of you have drones that are older than that, but the majority of drones don't last much longer than three years. Now, if you do have a drone that is still functioning at that time that doesn't have remote ID on it, also referred to by many as legacy drones, then the FAA has included an option to comply. So there will be three options for UAV pilots when it comes to remote ID. First, you can purchase and own a drone that already has remote ID installed by the manufacturer. You just buy it and fly it. Secondly, you will be able to retrofit your drone with a remote ID module of some kind. 
Now what that will look like remains to be seen as different manufacturers, I'm guessing, will have different styles. But this will be something that you can add to your drone that will broadcast identifying information. Now the downside here is that it adds additional cost to your hobby. The FAA anticipates about $50 per module. Now hopefully that price will be lower because there will be some competition. You know, companies are gonna wanna compete with each other for, you know, catching the market on these modules. So I think that price might be a little bit lower. The good news is if you're a recreational pilot and you only have one registration number for all of your drones, you know, if you have multiple drones, you only have to have one number and you put that same number on all of your drones, you will only need one remote ID module that can be used with all of your drones. You can take it off one drone and put it on another. I imagine it to be something similar to like the Loom Cube strobe. I use the Loom Cube strobe on my Mini 2 right here and I just use hook and loop. So I'm imagining it'd be something like that. The bad news with that, you know, if that's the case and someone finds it or someone takes it or whatever, they can use that broadcast module and put it on their drone and possibly get you in trouble. I don't think that would happen very often. So I don't know, we're not real sure how those broadcast modules are gonna be required to actually be attached. Now, if you're a part 107 pilot, you will need to register each drone just as it is now. And each drone would then need its own broadcast module. Now, the third way that drone pilots will be able to fly is to not have remote ID on your UAV and fly in what is called an FAA recognized identification area or also known as a FRIA. These are parks or fields that will be designated and approved by the FAA where you can fly around in a damn circle and marvel at how you just spent $1,200 to stand next to 30 other dudes recording the hayfield down below. I'm sorry, but if the FAA thinks people wanna be confined to designated spaces with a drone, they truly do not understand the hobby, or if they do, they just don't care. It's not how it used to be in the old days with RC model aircraft. People that buy drones don't buy drones just to fly. They buy drones to explore and create and share that perspective that they capture with others. Watch this video right here if you wanna see some amazing drone footage and see what hobby drones are actually meant to be used for. Now the last bit of good news and the best news overall is that if you have a drone that weighs less than 250 grams, it will not be required to have remote ID unless you intend to use that drone for commercial purposes and you have a part 107. You see, remote ID is tied to registration. Any drone that is required to be registered with the FAA will be required to have remote ID. So if you plan to just fly as a recreational pilot and your drone weighs less than 250 grams like the Mavic Mini or the Mini 2, you will be able to fly just like you do right now without registering and without broadcasting the identifying information. And that's pretty huge. And as I've said for the past year, this will result in manufacturers improving the functionality of small UAVs. In the next two years, we are going to see some incredibly high performance from sub 250 gram drones come to market. I'm talking a major influx of drones that won't need to comply with remote ID. And another great thing, I think they're gonna be actually affordable. They're not gonna be the $1,200, $1,500, $2,000 drones that are in the market now. They're gonna be the $499 drones. So I'm really excited to see what comes of that. So now, the bad news. When remote ID is finally here in about 32 months from now, and it is required to fly, this is pretty much how it's gonna work. First, you perform your pre-flight inspection, as you always should and then you'll set down your drone to fly, you turn it on, you turn on your controller, and then you wait. You wait for it to confirm that its remote ID is functional. And if it is not functional, you will not be able to launch your drone. Now, if you own a drone without remote ID and you have it retrofitted with a broadcast module, then the drone won't launch until that unit is functional and communicating with the drone and the control station. Now, once those are found to be working, then you lift off the ground and that's when the drone begins transmitting information about it over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. What kind of information will be broadcast? It will broadcast the flight session ID or the serial number of the drone, the latitude and longitude and altitude of the drone, the velocity, a time marker, and any safety codes. And worst of all, it will transmit the location of the control station. That means you, the pilot, 
your precise location. Anyone with a cell phone will be able to see everything about your drone and where you launched it from. And if they don't like it, they don't like what you're doing, they can call authorities or they can come confront you themselves. Now, what happens when the authorities come? Well, the FAA assumes that law enforcement will be able to evaluate your behavior and determine if it is legal or not. Page 170 states that law enforcement officer will educate the person manipulating the flight controls of the UAS or begin an investigation. Now, which of those two scenarios do you think is most likely to happen? Many commenters questioned who is going to educate all law enforcement about what is legal and what isn't when it comes to flying UAVs. Well, the FAA simply states that they are actively educating law enforcement on all FAA rules and regulations and that officers can contact law enforcement assistant program special agents for more information about FAA regulations. You know, because law enforcement have nothing else to do but sit down and study drone rules. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge educating all law enforcement on drone guidelines and rules and regulations. It's a long road. Now, many commenters expressed concern for pilot safety if control station location was broadcast. And what is the FAA's response? The FAA emphasizes that there are rules against interfering with an aircraft and we should use community outreach to mitigate such occurrences. Oh, okay. So since there are rules against breaking a law, then there's no need for concern. That makes me feel so much better. And also, as someone is kicking me in the neck to steal my drone, I will certainly try the community outreach strategy to let them know that what they are doing is illegal. I'm sure that will end it right there. <laughs> the Consumer Technology Association found in their research that 90%, 9 out of 10 of drone pilots expressed great concern for broadcasting control station location and 40% stated that it would deter them from flying. That means a lot of those people are not gonna fly anymore. They're gonna leave the hobby. And what is the FAA's response? On page 113, they state, it would be appropriate practice to operate from a secure or restricted location. Oh. And don't forget community outreach. Oh my God, the FAA doesn't even consider the fact that drone pilots could be tracked, harassed, assaulted, and robbed. All they say is it is necessary for complete transparency that control station location be broadcast. And not to worry, because there are laws against that. I can't even describe how absurdly asinine that attitude is. There are going to be drone pilots assaulted, harassed, and robbed. I promise you, 100%, we will see it in the news. It will happen. But there is one single ray of hope on page 162 when it comes to broadcasting control station location. The requirement is only that the launch location be stored and then broadcast continuously throughout the flight. It does not require that there be real-time updating of control station location. So this would suggest that a pilot could launch from one location and then navigate themselves with the control station to an alternate location without being tracked. Now, is that reasonable in most situations? Not really. Most likely you're going to stay where you launched from, but at least it's an option if you are worried about being assaulted or harassed. Now, if you do that, and this is something that we'll discuss in the future when that time comes, but if you happen to do that, don't forget to reset your return to home. Now, one thing that I haven't seen mentioned yet is the fact that this will ultimately destroy the toy drone market. Smaller companies that manufacture toy drones that weigh more than 0.55 pounds will most likely give up the business of drones due to the cost prohibitive nature of making all of their products in compliance with remote ID. And I can't remember what page it's on, but what the FAA said is that Times are changing and the skies are changing. So it's just part of progress. And I think that's really sad because toy drones are how a lot of young people get into drones. And so if these companies are going away and you're not able to purchase these toy drones, then we're going to be losing a lot of youth getting into this hobby. And it's really heartbreaking.
Okay, so we're getting a little long here, so I will start to wrap this up by talking about the other rulings that came out the same day as Remote ID, and that is being able to fly over people and being able to fly at night. Now, this is a completely different ruling, separate from Remote ID, and I think many people were confused by that. But the FAA also ruled that we will soon be able to fly over people as long as the drone meets a few requirements. Oh, and when I say we, I mean Part 107 pilots. These new guidelines are only for Part 107. As a recreational pilot, you still will not be able to fly over people, but you can fly at night just as you always have been able to. Yes, you can fly at night as a recreational pilot, I promise you. But for Part 107 pilots, there are four distinctions of safety risk. And although I'm not gonna cover them in detail here, basically, if you have a drone that doesn't have any exposed blades, that could cut a person, lacerate a person, you will be able to fly over people. And smaller drones will have more freedom than heavier drones. Flying at night for part 107 will be allowed as long as the pilot stays current with the new education requirements. Now those education requirements have yet to be announced and released. Ultimately, part 107 pilots will no longer have to pay an excessive fee and get recertified every 24 months. And so that is, very, very cool. No more studying for that test. <laughs> it's, it's not very much fun. And then also spending money every two years. It will be much easier now and we won't have to apply for daylight waivers. And I'm really looking forward to that because it can allow me to bring some nighttime flights to my channel to share with you guys. My suggestion here for you guys, to all of you, get your part 107. If it wasn't worth it for you before, it will be in the next two years. And if you're gonna stick with this hobby, I think it would be a wise decision to get it. Now, there will be several questions here. I'm sure I did not cover every single item and I'm sure I missed some things that maybe you have questions about. So ask away down in the comments. I will most likely make a follow-up video to this and in that video, I'll answer as many of the pertinent questions that you present to me in the comments. What's the takeaway here? Remote ID is final, but it's 32 months away, so you can relax. Broadcast-based is way better than internet-based remote ID, but don't get too comfortable with that because it could change in the future. If you have a legacy drone that doesn't have remote ID, don't worry. You will be able to purchase and install a broadcast module for around $50, but I actually think it's gonna be less than that. However, more than likely, you will have a new drone by then and one with remote ID already installed. Control station location will be broadcast, which is terrible and will absolutely deter many drone pilots from this hobby, but keep in mind that you can change your location after you launch if you are concerned about theft or harassment. The public will not have access to your private information. They're only going to see the, you know, the serial number of the drone or the session ID. They're going to see the direction, the altitude, all of that information. They're going to see where you launched from, but there's no way for them to tell who you are. They're not going to be able to access your private information or see exactly who it is. Only law enforcement or FAA officials will be able to cross-reference your serial number or your session ID. So. I guess that's kind of a positive. In order for this to work, the FAA has a lot of work to do over the next two years to educate law enforcement on what is legal and what is not legal when it comes to flying UAVs. It is imperative that the interactions between them and pilots are successful. And if both parties are ignorant, it's not gonna go well. And finally, as I've said over and over for the past year, the saving grace for recreational drone pilots will be the sub 250 gram drones like the Mavic Mini and the Mini 2. These small drones will now exponentially improve as research and development will shift towards them. I would say if we ever see a Mini 3 or similar model that you should snatch it up immediately. Now, if you can't wait till then, and you want the Mini 2 right now, there is a link in the video description down below to get your very own. Sorry, had to put that in there. Also, if you feel that I deserve a little thank you for reading this behemoth in less than 48 hours and giving you my thoughts, consider becoming a patron by clicking right here. You can join for just $2 a month and I truly appreciate the consideration. Click on one of the thumbs on your way out, preferably the one that's pointing up. I do like that one much better. Subscribe for more information on this and other valuable content. Thank you for watching the entire video today. Have a great day, everyone. And as always, fly safe 
and fly smart. Mm-hmm.